agreeable to the theocracy or divine government of Israel, the Indians think the deity to be the immediate head of their state. All the nations of Indians are exceedingly intoxicated with religious pride and have an inexpressible contempt of the white people, unless we accept those half-savage Europeans who become their proselytes. Nothings are the most favorable name they give us in their set speeches. Even the Indians who were formerly bred in amity with us and in enmity to the French used to call us, in their war orations, Hatuk Ukprus, the accursed people. But they flatter themselves with the name Hatuk Oratupa, the beloved people, because their supposed ancestors, as they affirm, were under the immediate government of the deity, who was present with them in a very particular manner, and directed them by prophets, while the rest of the world were aliens and outlaws to the covenant. When the Archimagus, or any one of their magi, is persuading the people at their religious solemnities to a strict observance of the old beloved or divine speech, he always calls them the beloved or holy people agreeable to the Hebrew epithet Ami during the theocracy of Israel. He urges them, with the greatest energy of expression he is capable of, a strong voice and very expressive gestures, to imitate the noble actions of their great and virtuous forefathers, which they performed in a surprising manner by their holy things and a strict observance of the old, beloved speech. Then he flourishes on their beloved land that flowed with milk and honey, telling them they had good and the best things in the greatest plenty, and speaks largely of their present martial customs and religious rites, which they derived from their illustrious predecessors, strictly charging them not to deviate in the least out of that old, beloved, beaten path, and they will surely meet with all the success that attended their beloved forefathers. I have heard the speaker on these occasions after quoting the war actions of their distinguished chieftains who fell in battle, urging them as a copy of imitation to the living, assure the audience that such a death in defense of their beloved land and beloved things was far preferable to some of their living pictures that were only spending a dying life, to the shame and danger of the society and of all their beloved things, while the others died by their virtue and still continue a living copy. Then to soften the thoughts of death, he tells them that they who died in battle are only gone to sleep with their beloved forefathers, for they always collect the bones, and mentions a common proverb they have, Natak Intaha, the days appointed or allowed him were finished, and this is their firm belief, for they affirm that there is a certain fixed time and place when and where everyone must die without any possibility of averting it. They frequently say, such a one was weighed on the path and made to be light, ascribing life and death to God's unerring and particular providence, which may be derived from a religious opinion and proverb of the Hebrews that the divine care extended itself from the horns of the unicorn to the very feet of the lice and the more refined part of the old heathens believed the like. The ancient Greeks and Romans, who were great copiers of the rites and customs of the Jews, believed there were three destinies who presided over human life, and had each of them their particular office. One held the distaff of life, while another spun the thread, and Atropos cut it off, a strong but wild picture of the divine fire, light, and spirit. When Virgil is praising the extraordinary virtue of Ripheus, who was killed in defense of his native city, Troy, he adds, Dies aliter visum est, submitting to the good and wise providence of the gods, who thought fit to call him off the stage. However, he seems to be perplexed on the subject, as he makes fate sometimes conditional. If the usual proper care had been taken, neither Jupiter nor fate would have hindered Troy from standing at this time. But if the time of dying was unalterably fixed, according to the Indian system or that of our fatalists, how would its votaries reconcile the scheme of divine providence, which must be in conformity to truth, reason, and goodness, and how explain the nature of moral good and evil? On their principle, self-murder would be a necessary act of a passive being set on work by the first mover, and his obligations would be proportionable only to his powers and faculties which would excuse the supposed criminal from any just future punishment for suicide. But religion and true reason deny the premises, and they themselves will not own the consequence. It is their opinion of the theocracy, or that God chose them out of all the rest of mankind as his peculiar and beloved people, 
which animates both the white Jew and the red American with that steady hatred against all the world except themselves and renders them hated or despised by all. The obstinacy of the former in shutting their eyes against the sacred oracles, which are very explicit and clear in the original text and of which they were the trustees, incites both our pity and reproof, whereas the other's firm adherence to and strong retention of the rights and customs of their forefathers only attract our admiration. The American Indians are so far from being atheists, as some godless Europeans have flattered themselves, to excuse their own infidelity, that they have the great sacred name of God, that describes his divine essence, and by which he manifested himself to Moses, and are firmly persuaded they now live under the immediate government of the deity. The ascension of the smoke of their victim, as a sweet favor to Yohiwa, is full proof to the contrary as also that they worship God in a smoke and cloud, believing Him to reside above the clouds and in the element of the supposed holy annual fire. It is no way material to fix any certain place for the residence of Him who is omnipresent and who sustains every system of beings. It is not essential to future happiness, whether we believe His chief place of abode is in Caelo Terdio, Paradiso Terrestri, or Elemento Ignea, God has placed conscience in us as a monitor, witness, and judge. It is the guilty or innocent mind that accuses or excuses us to Him. If any further knowledge were required, it would be revealed. But St. Paul studiously conceals the mysteries he saw in the imperial heavens. The place of the divine residence is commonly said to be above the clouds, but that is because of the distance of the place, as well as our utter ignorance of the nature of Elohim's existence, the omnipresent spirit of the universe. Our finite minds cannot comprehend a being who is infinite. This inscrutable labyrinth occasioned Simonides, a discreet heathen poet and philosopher, to request Hiero, king of Sicily, for several days successively, to grant him a longer time to describe the nature of the deity, and at the end, to confess ingenuously that the farther he waded in that deep mystery, the more he sunk out of his depth and was less able to define it. If we trace Indian antiquities ever so far, we shall find that not one of them ever retained or imbibed atheistical principles, except such whose interest as to futurity it notoriously appeared to be, whose practices made them tremble whenever they thought of a just and avenging God. But these rare instances were so far from infecting the rest that they were the more confirmed in the opinion of not being able either to live or die well without a God. And this all nature proclaims in every part of the universe.